Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are talking about uh, the mechanism by which uh, the nitrovasodilators, of which we have these three examples, glycerol trinitrate, isosorbide dinitrate, amyl nitrite, sodium nitroprusside, and mulcidamine, how they work to produce vasodilatation of a blood vessel. And basically, what they do is they are nitric oxide donors. So basically, in blood vessels, these things, these drugs, will start releasing nitric oxide. They'll start undergoing reactions uh, which produce nitric oxide. Now, sodium nitroprusside and morcidamine, these don't require any sort of enzyme to actually produce the nitric oxide. So um, these produce nitric oxide directly. So once you put them in the blood, they're going to start undergoing certain reactions and producing nitric oxide. The others, it's less clear, basically. Uh, so they may require enzymes uh, in the endothelium to actually uh, catalyze their reactions. Whatever the mechanism is, these start producing nitric oxide as well. So that's why another name for the nitrovasodilators is to call them nitric oxide donors, basically. So they're going to go into the circulation and they're going to produce nitric oxide. Now we know what nitric oxide does. It's the uh, endothelium derived relaxation factor. So what's going to happen is if we draw a picture of the uh, general structure of a blood vessel. So if we draw a picture of a general, the general structure of a blood vessel. So uh, the innermost layer of a blood vessel then, uh, and this is quite a small picture, I'll get another piece of paper for a bigger picture. Right, so the inner layer of a blood vessel is, as we know, the endothelial cells. Okay, so here's our blood vessel. Okay, so the innermost layer of the blood vessel, let's say this blood vessel here, okay, has the endothelial cells. So here's an endothelial cell, here's an endothelial cell, here's the next endothelial cell, here's our next endothelial cell, next endothelial cell, and there's our final endothelial cell. Okay, so let me add their little nuclei in. Okay, so this is the uh, endothelium lining the blood vessel right at the center. Then surrounding the endothelium, you have that basement membrane on which these endothelial cells are sitting. So here's the basement membrane on which the endothelial cells are sitting. Okay. Whoops. And then around that, you have the next layer of the blood vessel, um, which is the tunica media. So I should just say that the endothelium and the basement membrane together, that is known as tunica intima the intimate layer, the closest layer to the blood, which is obviously in this central lumen here. So this is the blood, okay? Right, so this is tunica intima. Tunica means a layer, intima means close. Okay, it's from where, it's the word from which intimate came from. Okay, so, well, it's got the same origin as the word intimate. Uh, so, right, so um, the next layer of the blood vessel, is the layer in which the smooth muscle is. So here is the tunica media, basically. And it's basically a layer consisting of smooth muscle cells, which are arranged in uh, circular structures. So they're arranged around the lumen of the blood vessel, and circulating the lumen of the blood vessel. And this is tunica media, the middle layer of the blood vessel. Okay, so you have... Um, you have smooth muscle cells arranged in circles, basically, around the lumen of the blood vessel. Okay, like so. So here are these smooth muscle cells, these spindle-shaped smooth muscle cells. Now, uh, basically, what's going to happen is if you want to vasodilate the blood vessel, what you need to do is you need to relax these, blood, uh, these smooth muscle cells because, as you can see, if these smooth muscle cells relax, they will, uh, they will gain length, they will get longer, basically. And if they get longer, the circumference of this circle is going to increase, basically. And if the circumference of the circle increases, the diameter of the circle increases. Okay? So, that will mean that the diameter of the lumen of the blood vessel is also going to increase. 
So what we want to do is we want to relax these smooth muscle cells here, basically. Now, uh, when we give nitrovasodilators such as glycerol, glycerol trinitrate, isosorbide dinitrate, um, amyl nitrite, um, uh, what was the other one? Nit sodium nitroprusside and morcidamine, um, they'll be metabolized to their active compounds in the case of isosorbide dinitrate and morcidamine, and then the active compounds will then start donating nitric oxide. So they'll go into the blood vessels and start releasing nitric oxide. The nitric oxide will diffuse past the endothelial cells and then it will go to the, these smooth muscle cells here and then it will cause those smooth muscle cells to relax basically in exactly the same way as it would if the endothelial cells had actually produced this nitric oxide. So the nitric oxide will go into the cytoplasm of the smooth muscle cell. Let's just recite this pathway. So nitric oxide goes into the cytoplasm of the smooth muscle cell and it's going to activate the enzyme uh, soluble guanolate cyclase. So let me draw this here. Okay, so within the smooth muscle cell, this is all happening. It's going to activate the enzyme soluble guanolate cyclase. Guanolate cyclase. Okay. And when soluble guanolate cyclase becomes active, it's going to start converting GTP, or guanosine triphosphate, GTP, into cyclic GMP, cyclic guanosine monophosphate, and pyrophosphate. So it's going to produce pyrophosphate as a byproduct as well. Okay, cyclic GMP is then going to activate another enzyme known as protein kinase G, or uh, cyclic GMP-dependent protein kinase. So this enzyme over here is cyclic GMP-dependent protein kinase, or just simply protein kinase G. Right, so this is cyclic GMP-dependent protein kinase. That's one name for it. Another name for it, which is coming, becoming more popular, I would say, protein kinase G. Okay, whoops, uh, there we go. Uh, protein kinase G, and that can often be abbreviated to just PKG. Right, so let me colour in protein kinase G here. So we'll colour in protein kinase G, this red colour here. Okay, now protein kinase G then causes uh, this um, smooth muscle cell to relax. So let me outline how it causes the smooth muscle cell to relax. So, in order for a smooth muscle cell to contract, then what needs to happen is the myosin proteins, which form the myosin filaments within the, um, within the smooth muscle cell, uh, need to be phosphorylated, basically. And they're phosphorylated by an enzyme known as myosin light chain kinase. And they are dephosphorylated by another enzyme known as myosin light chain phosphatase. So basically, what protein kinase G can do is it can activate myosin light chain phosphatase, which removes the phosphate groups off the myosin heads, myosin light chain phosphatase. And by removing these uh, phosphate groups off the uh, myosin uh, heads, uh, then you can stop the myosin heads from uh, undertaking the cross-bridge cycling, and therefore you can stop them from uh, contracting the smooth muscle cell. So, this is one way in which protein kinase G uh, causes uh, relaxation of the smooth muscle cell by activating this enzyme, myosin light chain phosphatase, often abbreviated to MLCP for short, uh, which will remove these phosphate groups from the myosin heads and thereby stop cross-bridge cycling of the myosin heads with the actin monomers. Okay? Uh, in addition, what it can do is it can, uh, it can weaken the calcium signal within the smooth muscle cell. So in order to get the uh, smooth muscle cell to contract, we need the activation of uh, this myosin light chain kinase enzyme. So we need to uh, have um, myosin light chain, oopsie, myosin 
myosin like chain uh, kinase needs to be active, basically. Okay, so we need to phosphorylate the myosin like chains. Now, uh, the enzyme which does that is this myosin like chain kinase. But to activate myosin like chain kinase and therefore activate contraction of the smooth muscle cell, you need calcium calmodulin complexes. And in order to have calcium calmodulin complexes, you need calcium signals. And to get calcium signals, you need to have calcium release from the endoplasmic reticulum. So, basically, what protein kinase G can do is it can phosphorylate and inactivate IP3 receptors. IP3 receptors are in the endoplasmic reticulum and release uh, calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum. So if you've inhibited these IP3 receptors, you're going to get less calcium release from the endoplasmic reticulum, and therefore you're going to get less activation of myosin-like chain kinase. In addition, protein kinase G activates the circa pump which pumps calcium back into the endoplasmic reticulum, or the sarcoplasmic reticulum, since we're talking about smooth muscle cells, and thereby uh, also reduces the calcium signal. So by these two mechanisms, it's going to reduce calcium signaling within the smooth muscle cell, thereby reducing the activation of myosin light chain kinase, but indirectly, basically. So it activates myosin light chain phosphatase directly and inactivates myosin light chain kinase indirectly. So that overall is going to reduce the number of the myosin heads which are uh, phosphorylated and therefore reduce the amount of contraction that's going to occur in the smooth muscle cell. Okay, right. So finally, let's discuss why this was actually useful for treating angina. And the reason for this is not, I repeat, is not uh, that it causes vasodilatation of this artery here. Because uh, that's what you'd think. You'd think, okay, we've started exercising. Um, that means that these diastolic periods have gone down. So let me just show this. The diastolic periods have gone down. Usually in a healthy person, what we would then do is vasodilate the blood vessels supplying the heart. And therefore, in this shorter diastolic period, we will deliver nutrients more rapidly. And therefore, we'll still manage to get um, all the nutrients that the heart needs, basically. Okay, we can't do that because of this atherosclerotic plaque and the blood vessel is already dilatated fully. So therefore, nitrovasodilators aren't going to work because, yes, they will come in here, yes, they will release nitric oxide, but the blood vessel is already dilated as much as it possibly can be. That was the reason it couldn't dilate anymore in the first place. So the nitrovasodilators actually don't have any effect on this. Um, and so that's not how they work. Instead, the way we think they work is they cause vasodilatation of the venous reservoir. So of these massive great veins um, containing the venous blood that's being returned to the right atrium. So basically what they're going to do is they're going to vasodilate um, the, um, the um, large veins of the of the body, basically, which is going to cause the pressure of the blood in these veins to go down.